In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is asked the question, which is the greatest commandment? He answered, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then again, at the Last Supper, he says the same thing, but with a twist. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. This time, Jesus replaced your neighbor with one another. This new love that Christ commands of us goes much deeper than the Old Testament commandment he was quoting in Matthew. The people we have been commanded to love has expanded beyond our neighborhoods to include, well, everyone. And this includes people who might make this commandment a bit difficult, like that confrontational coworker who just seems impossible to get along with, or your in-laws who never treated you like a part of the family. Or maybe the person you just met, who you don't even know and really need some help. You see, Jesus knew his physical time on earth was nearing an end. So in this new take on the old commandment, Jesus also made another change. The words, as yourself, became as I have loved you. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. Christ's sacrificial life provides a clear and concrete example of real and true love. And he put this love on display on a daily basis with his disciples. He was patient with them, speaking kindly and showing great concern for their welfare. He instructed, counseled, and comforted them, prayed with them and for them. He admonished them for wrongdoing and yet compassionately bore with their failings. And most of all, he gave his life, dying so that they and we might live. According to Jesus, this is how others will know that you are one of his followers. Not because you have a shirt or a bumper sticker that says so. Not because we announce it from a stage or a blog or a status update. But because they look at you, at how you live, the things you do and say, and they see Jesus. They see love. Good to see you all here. These are exciting times. Now, they're troublesome times. I certainly know that, and I certainly understand that. But they're also exciting times. We that are believers can see our upside down world and pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. But then we look at the videos from Samaritan's Purse and there are many that have not heard and understood the message of the gospel. So even the simple thing that we have of spending a few extra dollars at the the dollar store at Walmart when we go by to pick up some crayons or a hair ribbon or a, a colorful ruler so that we can pack them in the uh, boxes and send them out. And uh, I personally am honored that uh, Paul Butler, who has spoken from the sacred desk on a number of occasions, is hip deep in the Operation Christmas Child and distributions to Africa. And so it's exciting to be a part of that. So in one breath we say, Lord, come quickly, and another we say, Lord, there are still some people out there that have still not heard the gospel. And we need to do our part in getting the gospel out. The pandemic uh, depending on definition and how you want to slant it has, uh, in some cases, uh, been reduced to an epidemic. Um, you may not have seen this week, but Florida 
will be 100% open, which Judy and I are rejoicing about, because we're heading down there in about three weeks. And uh, <laughs> uh, they, they had announced that October 5th that the restaurants, uh, that the restrictions would be lifted, and then uh, Ron DeSantis said all restrictions are lifted. And <clears throat> it's an interesting study to see that South Dakota never shut down. And now Florida is going to be wide open. And I think that you will start to see states realize that perhaps some tyrants have gone too far. Now, again, I understand COVID is real. And I understand that there are some people that are more susceptible to it than others. So I am not a COVID denier. I try to be a COVID realist that uh, I am more likely to get killed by a clown driving a cigar <coughs> truck than by catching COVID. But COVID is real, and I have not seen any clowns driving cigar trucks lately, and so that, that's just an example. That, that's not, uh, uh, that's what they, the courts would call anecdotal. It's, it's not uh, easily uh, proven. I saw a book, oh boy, five, six weeks ago, Unquestioned Answered, and boy, that title just reached out and grabbed me. And it's an interesting read. I, I skimmed the book. Um, well, I tell you what, if you are not taking advantage of the miracle, I'm going to show my age here, you know. I, I have been, for you younger folks, I realize I am, I am an immigrant to technology, where some of you are natives to technology, you were born in it. Uh, it's, it's pretty bad when, when our uh, four-year-old granddaughter knows more about how to work her way around an iPad than we do. But the e-books are just, I, I'm, I am now a believer uh, in e-books, and uh, it's funny. I, I, I'm in the uh, Anne Arundel Library system, and I'm also in the uh, Baltimore City system. I think I even have an account up here. And uh, a book that I wanted to get, somebody might have seen the post on Facebook, a book that I wanted to get of a very popular author. Uh, Anne Arundel County had 30 copies, and I was number 96 on the list. That same book, they had audio books. I think they had about a dozen and a half, and I was number 115 on the list. And then uh, the same book and an e-book, uh, they had something like a dozen, dozen and a half copies, and I was over 100 on the list. And then I go over to Enoch Pratt, and he said, yes, we have that. You're number one. You can, you can check it out. <laughs> so anyway, on question answers, I was able to review the book. What the premise is, there are 10 things that we say in Christianity, common things that we say, that are really not biblical. You've heard people say at a funeral, well, they're an angel now. No, they're not an angel now. An angel is a created being. You and I are children of God. So if they're in heaven, they're in heaven as a family member, not the hired help. But anyways, this title reached out and grabbed me, and so I decided to, to use it in this because our premise this morning, the Pharisees asked him questions in fact, our, uh, our verse. The Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. And uh, I've heard that there's supposed to be a debate this week, a presidential debate, and each of the candidates will be trying to trap the other in their words and get them all jumbled up. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that, but I hope we can shed a little bit of light on Scripture this morning. Let's pray and get started. Now, Lord, we... Thank you for the clarity of your word, that you loved us enough to give us your word. And Lord, we pray that we will love you enough to not only read your word, but to study your word, to dwell on your word, because we know that this is how you speak to us in this day and age. Now, we just pray that you would open our hearts, our minds, our emotions, that we would be willing to hear a new thing 
and apply it to our lives where necessary. In your name we ask. Amen. The Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. The Greek word that is translated in uh, this passage, to trap him, means to ensnare, to entrap, to entangle. Literally, to trick or distort, to hang him by his own rope. So it's a hunting term. Setting a trap, setting a snare that you can capture an animal. And they're stalking their prey. The Pharisees uh, and the religious leaders are stalking Jesus just like a hunter would stalk a wild or stalk an animal to put food on the table. Jesus was widely known during his time in public ministry, but he was not necessarily widely liked, especially by the religious higher-ups. I fear that in too many pulpits in America and around the world, that too many ministers want to be widely liked. Jesus himself was not widely liked. He made people uncomfortable. He made people squirm. He made people realize that they were sinners. And the scripture says that men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. If, and that's in John chapter 3, verse 19. Right after John 3, 16. Men love darkness rather than light. So God sent his son into the world, but men would rather have, some men, some people, would rather have darkness because they have evil deeds. So if you tell the truth to people and back it up with the gospel, you are not going to be well liked in all circles because Jesus was not. As we will see this morning, there were three specific groups of the religious and the political elite that targeted Jesus. The Herodians, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. They were not accustomed to having their words and their deeds challenged. They were elite. They were wealthy. They made the rules, and so they made special rules for themselves. They could say almost anything, and people were afraid to question them. Then came Jesus. He spoke with authority. Jesus talked back to the religious leaders of the day, and they did not like it. But many of the common people liked Jesus because what he said made sense. It spoke not only to their ears, but it spoke to their hearts and their soul. Regular people respected and followed Jesus. They couldn't get enough because they had not heard this kind of thing before. The religious of that elite, those elite, they had a lot of rules, they had a lot of regulations, and we'll, we'll point that out in a minute. But Jesus had love. Jesus had compassion. Yes, Jesus did get harsh sometimes, but if you look closely, it was never at seeking people that he was harsh with. He was only harsh with the self-important religious elite of that day. I think people liked seeing Jesus put the elite on the spot. These religious elite, political elite, they seem to see their stranglehold on the population slipping, so they decided to take a little bit more aggressive action. They were always trying to trap Jesus by asking trick questions. And they questioned him on everything from taxes to heaven to marriage. And while the questions from these groups were rarely sincere, we can still learn about the heart of, a lot about the heart of God and often the selfishness in our own hearts through these exchanges. So let's get started here. The Herodians asked 
a political question. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Wow, are they, are they puffing him up, right? Tell us then, by what is, your, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, the Herodians were a non-religious Jewish political party who supported the dynasty of Herod and the general policy of the Roman government. They perceived that Jesus' pure and spiritual teaching and influence were antagonistic to their interests. Wow, we could be delighted with that, but we don't have the time this morning. Pharisees, on the other hand, were members of an ancient Jewish sect, Jewish sect who believe the strict observance of both the oral traditions and the written law of Moses. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah despite the many miracles and despite Old Testament property, property, prophecies, excuse me, they did not want to believe in them. So although the Herodians and the Pharisees were at opposite ends of the political spectrum, their common hatred of Jesus was enough for them to join forces to try and destroy it. So here's the context of the command of Jesus to render Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Palm Sunday had just passed. Jesus had returned to Jerusalem for the final time, and he had just recently shared several parables with the crowd. His enemies saw their opportunity to put Jesus on the spot so in verse 17, they say, tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It was a trick question. They knew it. Jesus knew it. If Jesus answered no, the Herodians would charge him with treason and all the way. If he said yes, the Pharisees would accuse him of disloyalty to the Jews, and they would he would lose his support in the crowds. To pay taxes or not to pay taxes. That's a military term. We won't get into it now. But it was a catch-22 question. Uh, catch-22 is a military term. And it just can be described logically as a darned if you do and a darned if you don't. You've heard that perhaps in a different way. A vicious circle, a chicken and an egg situation. A heads I win, tails you lose. They thought they had it. But his response was nothing short of brilliant. Jesus, aware of their malice and why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. The denarius was a coin used as tax money at the time. It was made of silver and featured an image of an emperor, Caesar, with an inscription calling him divine. See, the Jews considered such images idolatry, forbidden by the second commandment. There was a second reason if Jesus answered yes, he would be in trouble because his acceptance of the tax as lawful could have been seen as a, a rejection of the second commandment, thus casting doubt on his claim to be the Son of God. They had him. They, they had him. They were anticipating. They couldn't wait to hear what he was going to say. And we know the story. Whose likeness is on the coin? Well, Caesar, of course. Well, there Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render to God the things that are God's. And upon hearing this, his enemies marveled and went away. See, when Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he was drawing a sharp distinction between two kingdoms. We have that dilemma today. There's a kingdom of this world and the government controls it. There's another kingdom not of this world that Jesus is uh, in charge of. We are part of both kingdoms, just as the Jews of that day were part of the Roman kingdom and Jesus was inviting them to his kingdom. Under Caesar and Washington, D.C., we have certain obligations that involve material things. Under Christ, we have additional obligations that involve things 
eternal. If the government lawfully, key phrase, key word, lawfully demands money, we need to give it to them. But make sure you also give God what is His. Here's the thing. Jesus recognized the authority of the government even though it wasn't fair and pure in their eyes. I'm sorry to have to report this this morning, folks, but Jesus said pay taxes. Now, don't pay any more than you have to, but don't pay any less than you're supposed to. Christ says because Caesar's image is on it, there is a requirement to pay certain taxes. Render under render unto America the things that are America's and unto God the things that are God. And just in the same way we are created in the image of God, just as the money we carry in our pockets is created in the image of the government and is owned by the government. We just use it as a way of trade. Pay your taxes. We want paved roads, we want safe bridges, we want clean water, and especially, we want our toilet to flush. <laughs> you know, then there are things, there are infrastructures that the government has to have money to maintain those things. Now, there is a time when we disobey the government. In Exodus, the mother of Moses refused to kill her baby by throwing him in the Nile River. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel resisted the Babylonian food that was required for him to eat. Daniel 3, they resisted bowing to the golden image. In Daniel 3, there was also a law established making it illegal to pray, but yet Daniel opened his windows to Jerusalem and prayed. We see uh, that this week, I forget exactly where it was, uh, I guess it's outside of Moscow, there must be a, a city in America, in, in Moscow somewhere, that they, people were singing. And so they, they arrested them one by one, oh boy. In Acts, it became unlawful, the book of Acts, to preach the gospel in the name of Jesus. And Peter told the authorities, we ought to obey God rather than man. When asked if he was willing to go to jail, John MacArthur recently said, yes, and I'll start a jail ministry from the inside if I have to. You know, it's interesting how things work. Uh, just this last week, they've been taken into court, the church and uh, John MacArthur for the third time, and they asked for a jury trial, which is our right under our Constitution. Well, the leaders in California, not thinking past, uh, I have to be kind, they didn't think things fully out. They've eliminated all jury trials till after the first of the year. And so the judge, when they said, judge, we think we need to, we can have, we should have a jury trial. He says, you know what, I think you're right. Well, since L.A. has eliminated all jury trials the first year, they're good to go until 2121. And I would be, if I were a wagering man, I'd be wager, willing to wager that most of these COVID restrictions will be gone by the turn of the first of the year. It will still be a real thing, but the real thing has been blown out of proportion. I think I mentioned a few weeks ago, you riding here in your car today, you're eight times more likely to die in an automobile accident than to catch COVID. So, uh, all of those things, we see that the religious and communi community leaders asked Jesus a political question, and he did not shy away from it. It was strictly a political, but he was a religious leader, but he did not shy away from the political realization that he was living in. The next thing, the Sadducees asked him a doctrinal question. Teacher! They said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there were seven mother, uh, brothers among us. 
The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. Same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Hot now then, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be at the seven, of the seven, since all of them were married to her? First question I had, let's get this woman a cookbook, because she's killing off everybody in her family. I don't know, it just kind of seems obvious to me. The Sadducees challenged Jesus, but they were fair. They also gave the Pharisees a, a hard time, too. And the Pharisees, they, the Sadducees had asked uh, the Pharisees this question, never got a good answer as far as they were concerned. They thought, okay, this is work on the Pharisees. Let, let's uh, jam up Jesus with this exact same question. Now, the Sadducees did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in the resurrection. So the question they were asking was moot because they didn't even believe what they were asking. It was only to tangle up Jesus and the Pharisees. So they don't believe in life after death. They don't believe in uh, heaven. They don't believe in angels. This is why they were sad, you see. All right, I only got a few minutes here. So the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in life after this. Even Paul the Apostle said, in, 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 in this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all people most miserable. You run into somebody that doesn't believe in heaven, they don't believe in hell, they don't believe in the afterlife. Uh, we go back to the old uh, song, and the, the artist escapes me, but is that all there is? Is this all there is? If this is all there is, what's the song say? Let's keep on dancing, let's bring out the booze, let's have a ball. The Sadducees brought up the silly question because they wanted to jam up Jesus. My time is getting close here. But they, Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scripture and the power of God. He just told, in effect, the Pope, you need to read your Bible a little bit more and figure out what's going on because you don't understand it. So the answer did not satisfy them. They did not get what they wanted. They asked him, a doctrinal question. And then finally, the Pharisees asked an ethical question. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Well, we saw the clip, but it was a loaded question. And here's why it was a loaded question. Moses gave the Ten Commandments. The religious elite of that day, and in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus and Exodus and all of that, and all of those things, they came up with 613 separate laws. 247 affirmative laws, you shall do this. 365 negative laws, you shall not do this. Heavy laws, like we would call a felony. Light laws, like we call a misdemeanor. Uh, at, at the Catholic Church have moral and venial sins. They have all of these. Now, although they spent the time ranking the laws, they considered all laws equal because God commanded them. So by Jesus saying which law was the greatest, he would say, well, the other laws aren't so important. They thought they had them again. Here's the thing. Jesus kept the law and the commandments of Moses in every single way. But we remember the time when the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, your disciples, they didn't wash their hands before they ate. And we've talked about this before. Well, yes, they're supposed to wash their hands, but the Pharisees had said, okay, well, they'd set up a fence law. Well, to make sure you do it exactly right, what you should do is, is wash your hands in a certain way and seven times, and the water's, you got to hold your hands and the, uh, the water's got to drip off of your elbow in a certain way, or you haven't really washed your hands. They were fence laws. They were laws that they made up to keep people from breaking the other laws. And so Jesus said, 
you know, you're making this up. These are the traditions of men. That's a, that's a word, a phrase that you'll find Jesus. You are talking about the traditions of men, not the laws of God. There are a lot of unquestioned answers in our lives. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament asks, what must I do? That's what the Ten Commandments all, are all about. What can I do? And the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments are given to show us that we cannot keep the entire law of God. If someone says, well, I keep the Ten Commandments, you're a liar. Nobody keeps all the Ten Commandments. You cannot. It's impossible. The Old Testament says, what must I do? Jesus and the New Covenant said, look what Jesus has done. Too many people in this day and age think they're going to get to heaven because of the good things they do. The Bible says all of the good things we can do are like filthy rags. And you want to have a Bible study sometime, you dig into what filthy rags means and you will be shocked use a term we learned a few weeks ago, you will be gobsmacked what that term, filthy rags, means in the Old Testament. So Jesus told them, love the Lord, love God with all your heart, be nice to your neighbor too, but don't just love them as you love yourself. Let's step it up. Love your neighbors as I have loved you. Wow. How much more can you love a neighbor than how much Jesus loves them? This morning, are you looking for a way to serve or are you looking for an excuse not to? It's not wrong to ask answer or to ask questions for a clarification. But we saw this morning that the religious leaders were looking for conflict, not clarification. Because when they were given the clarification, they walked away without accepting. This morning, you know where you are in your spiritual life. I don't know where you are in your spiritual life. It's not for me to judge. But are, where you, are you where you're supposed to be? Are you, are you where God wants you to be? Are you loving your neighbor just as much as you love yourself? Or have you stepped up that game to you love your neighbor as much as Jesus loved them? We're all going to fall short of that, I know. Each and every one of us has something in our lives right now that we need to give to God, that we need to turn over to God, that we need to give up for God, or we need to start doing for God. We need to start looking for reasons and stop looking for excuse, excuses. Let's all stand. We're going to have the praise team come. We're going to play a verse of invitation. This is the time to do business with God. Quiet, quietly in your heart as the music plays. Confess that sin that you know you need to confess. Ask God for forgiveness of the things that he needs to forgive you for. And make the determination that you're going to do the right thing for the right reason starting today. Now, Lord, we pray that you take these words, pray that you open our hearts, pray that you would open our minds and our conscience, that we would turn our thoughts, our minds, our actions, turn everything to you. In your name we ask. Amen. Let's remain standing.
case you did not see, on, September, on October the 11th, at, in the afternoon, I don't know the exact time, there will be a memorial service for Bobby Lewis at the Lewis Farm, 3 o'clock, 3 p.m., Sunday the 11th. Uh, we're also having a business meeting that same morning and following that, that service. So, so if anybody's interested, it's at the farm, the Lewis's farm up in Lisbon. So, Bobby? Um, I have two sign-up sheets out in the uh, fellowship hall. One is for people that are interested in going to the Operation Christmas Child Processing Center, like we do. I don't know exactly what date yet because I haven't been able to call in. Uh, uh, the day is the 30th that I have to call in. And the other one is for ladies' fellowship. We used to have breakfast, but someone made a uh, suggestion this morning to have a brunch on Sunday after church but we have to I'm going to send out an email and but anybody who's interested in either one of those things I appreciate a head count I was thinking of the name of your uh, passage this morning of your sermon that would be like saying Jeopardy you know unanswered questions <laughs> you know when nobody does that when nobody does he answers his, and he sits there and doesn't do anything you know, unanswered questions, or unquestioned answers, rather, you know. Another way I was looking at it is Jeopardy. That's all, everyone. Please stand. We'll close in the first prayer. Yeah. Because he lives.